Hello everyone, this is Southern Bell Whisper. I hope you all are doing well today. I went to the library earlier because I told you guys I'm trying to get a 911 dispatcher job. And so I went straight to the library this morning and I printed, filled out and printed out the application and faxed it to the with County uh, administrative office and then I called them to make sure they got it and okay I'm gonna let go I'm gonna let go and I'm not gonna think about it anymore if it's meant to be it'll be and if not it's okay so but while I was there there was a book sale And um, so I bought five books. I controlled myself a little bit. I bought five books. These are all true books. Um, your girl loves true books. The first uh, four, I think, yes, the first four are going to be true crime. Um, I love me some true crime. Yes, I do. So, but also we are going to be drinking a little bit of alcohol uh, journey uh, not only well he knocked this over so now there's only like half left but then I have this to drink after the video so um, I'm not really a drinker like that I just just felt like it was just one of those days that you know just relax because at seven o'clock I need to turn Q99 on because I didn't hear my story last night, but tonight maybe. So we'll see. But we are uh, we're going to be talking about books, and we're going to be drinking this Country Club Sweet Lager. I like this. I usually do not like beer like that, but that's really good. That's that's super. First one is Anne Rule. She is my favorite to crime author. And I do not think I've read this one. This this is one of her um standalone books. So it's possession. And I got this for a quarter. I got this one for a quarter. The librarian asked me, she was like, what would, what would you like to pay for these? And I was like, I don't want to go too high, but I don't want to go too low either. So she gave me the little books for 25 cents and the bigger books for 50 cents. So, alright. On the back it says, The author of 10 New York Times bestsellers and rule is peerless at capturing the darkly fascinating worlds of America's most twisted crim crim criminals. I'm not even drunk yet. Now look at me. Now this undisputed master of true crime brings her formidable talents to her first novel, a riveting tale of psychological suspense. When Danny and Joanne Lindstrom's camping trip in the Cascade Mountains goes terribly awary, beautiful young Joanne is left alone and stranded in the savage wilderness. Her last hope is to rely on another camper, a tall stranger who seems to know the forest and the dangers there all too well. Without him, she will surely die. With him, her future is as unpredictable as the lowering clouds that envelop the mountain. He asked only that she trust him. Totally. Possession, possession, possession. I love Hannibal. Yeah, just because I have a Kindle doesn't mean I don't. 
So that is possession. Let's take another drink of our liquor here. I also love my uh, one of my. I want to say patience so bad. Eleven years this is ENA. One of my customers bought <clears throat> this yesterday, and I was. I was wondering how it tasted. This this is really really good. It's not technically beer though. I think my dad said it's um liquor, malt liquor. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay, so the next one is now I have. I think I read. Skipping Christmas by John Grisham. Um, I'm not interested in crime books that aren't true, if you know what I mean. But I found this one today, and I, at first I knew he was mostly a fictional author, but I found this one today, and it is a true crime book. It's called The Innocent. says, in the town of Ida, Oklahoma, Ron Williamson was going to be the next Mickey Mantle, but on his way to the big leagues, Ron stumbled, his dreams broken by drinking drugs and women. Then, on a winter night in 1982, not far from Ron's home, a young cocktail waitress named Deborah Sue Carter was savagely mur murdered. The investigation led nowhere until on the filmiest evidence it led to Ron Williamson. The washed up small town hero was charged, tried, and sentenced to death. In a trial littered with lying witnesses and tainted evidence that would shatter a man's already broken life and let a true killer go free. This reminds me, uh, I read in a People magazine uh, recently that uh, they're trying to say that Scott Peterson was innocent, that his lawyers have found new evidence that suggests that he's innocent. Oh, it makes my blood boil. Him and Chris Watts can They can go to hell, both of them. They all know, uh, we all know, like, okay, let's, let's discuss this. Do you guys think he's innocent? Let me know in the comments, because I love discussing things with people. I love discussing true crime with people. Do you think he's innocent? I don't. He was freaking smiling at her, uh, how do you say, vagil? Vigil? Vagil? Like right after she passed away, and he's standing there smiling, talking on the phone to Amber Fry. Of course he's guilty. Oh my gosh. I don't know what this world's coming to that they would let somebody like him go free. But whatever. Let's take another drink on that too. Scott Peterson going back to having life in prison without the possibility of parole. And he was on death row. That should be dead by now. Okay. This one is a series. I remember um, reading this series when I was very young. Um, me and my mama read the same books. And she was like, uh, Kelly, you should no, I don't even think. I picked it up one day and she was like, Kelly, it's very intense. But I had heard about it so much, I think I was like 11 years old. Sorry. Excuse me. Beer makes my stomach bubble. <laughs> this is a child called It. 
and the lost boy um, it's been so long since i've read these so i'm very interested in reading them again but i also wanted them for my collection um, i know it talks a lot about child abuse severe child abuse So it's a child called It by Dave Peltzer. A child called It. A child called It is an unforgettable account of one of the most severe child abuse cases in California history. It is a story of Dave Peltzer who was brutally beaten and starved by his emotionally unstable alcoholic mother. A mother who played torturous, unpredictable games, games that left him nearly dead. He had, he had to learn how to play his mother's games in order to survive because she no longer considered him a son, but a slave, and no longer a boy, but an it. Dave's bed was an old army cot in the basement, and his clothes were torn and raunchy. When his mother allowed him the luxury of food, it was nothing more than spoiled scraps that even the dogs refused to eat. The outside world knew nothing of his living nightmare. He had nothing and no one to turn to, but his dreams kept him alive. Dreams of someone taking care of him, loving him, and calling him their son. Through each struggle, you'll find yourself enduring his pain, comforting his loneliness, and fighting for his will to survive. This compelling story will awaken you to the truth about child abuse and the ability we all have to make a difference. This is Dave Belter right here. He, he looks so sweet too, don't he? So that is a child called It. This is the second book to the series. There's three books. There is A Child Called Ed, The Lost Boy, and A Man Called Dave that I liked a little bit less than the first two. Imagine a young boy who has never had a home. His only possessions are the old torn clothes he carries in a paper bag. His only world is isolation and fear. Although this, this young boy has been rescued from his alcoholic mother, the real hurt is just beginning. He has no place to call home. This is Dave Peltzer's long awaited sequel to A Child Called It. Answers will be exposed and new ventures revealed in this compelling story of his life as an adolescent. Now considered an F child, a foster child, he experiences the instability of moving in and out of five different foster homes who feel that all foster kids are trouble and unworthy of being because they are not part of a real family. See, this little barcode is covering a lot of that, so I just... I like the second one, too. It's, it's very deep and upsetting, and it's almost hard to believe in ways that somebody would be that evil as to hurt their own child. I couldn't imagine. If I ever had a child, I would never hurt him like, like that, like this. Crazy, crazy. Okay, the last book I got, and I'm really excited about this one, is Chicken Soup for the Soul by Cat's Life. I love chicken soup books, but I love that I'd almost give, I'd almost walked away from the shelf. I was like, okay, I have enough. I have enough now. But then I scanned the bottom shelves and I found this one. I was so excited. The cat's like, do you want to read a story? Let's flip, and then whatever we flip to. I'm 
Okay, here we are. Okay. Escorting a cat. I looked down at her and she looked up at me. The year before my wife and I had picked her out from the animal shelter. Do you want to go for a walk? I asked. Meow. It was a cute furry face. Black, white, and yellow, and her tail was wagging. Just don't run away, okay? I said, meow. I opened the front door and she slid out, brushing against my leg. I set the timer on my wristwatch and I followed her. I was hoping for a pleasant 30 minute walk. She stepped off the porch, hopped down the rock ledge, trotted along the side of our house and ran across the backyard. Then she ran up the hill toward the cypress bush and crept inside. She sat on a soft bed of leaves and calmly peeked out the branches into the nearby woods. As a younger man, I would never have the patience to walk a cat or wait for it to emerge from under a bush, but I now enjoy the solitude it brings. I enjoy being alone with my cat. My wife wants to keep our cat safe inside the house with soft pillows and plush carpeting, but I think that's cruel. I say a cat should be a cat. A cat should sniff, explore, and experience the world. My wife insists I walk our cat on a leash, but me walking a cat on a leash is not going to happen. Our compromise is that I escort the cat. Wherever the cat goes, I go. So essentially the cat can walks me. I've been escorting Kiwi each day after work and recently have realized that I'm bonding more with my cat than my wife. I am learning so much about this beautiful little creature. She loves climbing high into trees, eating insects, and sniffing deer poop in the grass. This summer she was stung on her pink nose by an angry yellow jacket while sniffing a poisonous mushroom. If my wife knew any of this, she would have a coronary. I enjoy getting out of the house to walk the cat. I enjoy watching Kiwi crouch down and wiggle her little butt before she attacks a tree. I enjoy watching her tentatively paw green grass, spiders, and softballs. I laugh at her wide-eyed, befuddled expression when she contemplates the aerobic squirrels jumping from tree to tree or the birds parroting in the blue sky. Someone once said a dog is prose, a cat is poetry. I agree. Our cat is a poem with fur. It's peaceful walking my cat. A cat does not argue with me or yell. It simply goes about its own business. I merely follow. There is no friction or difference of, of opinion with my cat. Sometimes I step out on myself and watch myself watching Kiwi. My neighbors must think me eccentric, an odd, middle-aged man, always alone, wearing a red hat, smiling at something in a bush or a tree. Watching my cat, I've discovered that she is a graceful and agile hunter who thinks falling leaves are animals. She enjoys rubbing against thorny pricker bushes. I've also noticed she's becoming more confident and with a rolling gait is venturing deeper into the woods behind our home. As a younger man, I don't, I didn't observe things much or appreciate simple pleasures like walking a cat, but I do now. Consequently, I'm happier. I'm content being alone with my thoughts and my funny pet. Sometimes I take along the word jumble from the local newspaper or an unread section from the Sunday news. Periodically, I look up not want to miss anything special like kiwi pawing at a worm or chasing a chipmunk. Our young daughter adores our cat too. Since she is our only child, my wife and I figured a cat could be an excellent companion, like the little sister she never had. After school, our daughter enjoys putting kiwi in grocery bags, playing fetch with her, or dressing her up in dainty outfits. A cat isn't a sister, but it's better than nothing. Zoe, I sometimes ask, do you want to come with me to walk Kiwi? No, Dad, she usually says. Zoe has just turned 13 and prefers the computer, texting, or going to the mall with friends. 
I guess a teenager needs to be a teenager, just like a cat needs to be a cat. But a father needs to be a father, so I end up walking her little sister alone. The other day, I was looking at, down at the word jumble, trying to unscramble the letters H-I-T-B-R. When I looked up, Kiwi was gone. Kiwi, I called. I looked everywhere, but her camouflage fur blended well into nature. I couldn't find her anywhere. She had vanished. I searched around our home a third time. Why weren't you more careful, cried my wife in my mind. I searched for Kiwi. I searched for Kiwi in all of her favorite spots, under the porch, under our car, behind flower pots, and up the hill under the braid of bush. But the only thing I saw was my wife's imaginary worried face. I began to think about lost cat posters stapled onto telephone poles. I thought of Zoe and lost child photos on milk cartons. I kept searching. Kiwi, I called out. Where was she? It was getting dark. A cat has to be a cat, I practiced saying, which I would soon have to repeat to my wife. We lost her, she would sob. I sipped up my jacket and kept searching, but my heart was beginning to sink. Kiwi, I tried again. It was getting darker and colder. I thought about the dogs in the area. I thought about the stray cats in the neighborhood. Strays are filthy. Would Kiwi, our little poem with fur, become pals with them? Would she pick up bad habits and go wild? Would Zoe's little sister prefer independence and freedom instead of our soft pillows and flesh carpeting? Kiwi was an important part of our family. Did, we, did she know we loved her? Did she love us? Kiwi, I called again. I looked at my watch. Our quick 30 minute walk was turning into a horrible nightmare. I walked up the hill to the cypress bush and peered into the woods. Kiwi, I, snapped it, I stepped into the woods. Dead brown leaves crunched underfoot. We lost her, my wife's voice repeated in my head. As I walked deeper into the woods, I, I remembered an event 11 years earlier. My wife was sitting in a white hospital room and a kind doctor was sitting beside her. He told us that the child growing within her wasn't viable. I looked up into the trees blowing in the cold night breeze and I began to understand her better. I continued to search the woods and suddenly felt a sob coming out, coming on. It came out long and hard, but it was dark and I was alone, so it was okay. All I could see was my wife's sad face as the doctor consoled her. Her sadness was rubbing off on me because I realized her sadness was my sadness. Then I thought of Zoe, our other piece of poetry. Earlier this morning, she was arguing with her mother about going to the mall with her friends. Each day, Zoe has grown more independent and confident. A teenager has to be a teenager. That's when I heard something rustle in the leaves and I felt something rub against my ankle. I looked down and stared up at me where green eyes glowing in the dark. It was Kiwi. I bent down, picked her up, and cradled her in my arms. I held her against my leather jacket and kissed the back of her head. Then we started walking home. A cat has to be a cat, I guess, but sometimes it's a baby. After I did that uh, abuse awareness video last night, I had a dream that I was sitting in the kitchen at my ex's family's home and Patty Cake was coming up to me and I was just telling her how much I missed her and uh, I woke up wanting to cry. That's okay. So let's take another drink of this. Alright you guys, I love you guys, I hope you enjoyed this and I'll talk to you later.